Hello, and welcome to the Building Blocks of Deep Learning, where we learn how and when to use different layers of neural networks in, in concert. Um, today, we're talking about tabular data. Uh, tabular data is the basic type of data that you'd see. So if you've dealt with you know classic data sets like the Iris data set, if you've dealt with the Boston Housing data set, if you've dealt with you know the, the Wine data set, um, these are all examples of tabular data. I'll show you an example below. Um, to be very, very specific, tabular data is something where the data points are sampled uh, independently. So one data point doesn't necessarily, uh, is, is going to be sampled, it's going to be independent of a second data point. And where we don't make any assumptions on how the different dimensions of that data point are, uh, are generated. Um, this is as opposed to time series where you would actually have or, or maybe natural language where the data points are not sampled independently, right? They, there is some temporal structure to it, so they are dependent on their previous results um, and would be different from uh, image data where we would assume the dimensions of this data, which would be pixels, uh, have some sort of generating structure in that uh, the pixels near each other are going to be more influential to, uh, to each other than the pixels far away. <clears throat> so tabular data. Um, so I'm going to be showing you how, you know, what's the basic neural network structure that you would use to approach a tabular data problem. Um, and again, I, I mentioned this, you know, most people use neural networks for uh, things that I, I would sort of call more natural, uh, natural data. So, you know, uh, uh, image data, natural language data, you know, sound data, you know, movie data, things that sort of humans can see and sort of do a really good job at. Uh, tabular data is not one of the initial uh, one of the initial data sets that people approached with neural networks for a couple of reasons, and I talk about that in the introduction. So if you want to go see that, please go check out the introduction. But it's important to sort of know what the what the general structure to approach this is, and in fact, neural networks can make a good dent into tabular data as as opposed to something well in also in in conjunction with something like uh, gradient boosting. You know, you might use two models and do an ensemble together, or you could go ahead and and see which one works better for you. But with no further ado, because that was a lot, let's get started. So the first thing I want to do is I want to go ahead and I want to import something that makes our data. Um, so in this case, I want to be really simple. I'm not going to go ahead and, and uh, look at a, a real world data set. I'm going to make the data just because I'm, I'm showing you uh, a technique. There's no need to go ahead and, and, and use real world data here. Uh, I'm using the scikit-learn uh, function make classification. Uh, the make classification uh, goes ahead and does two things. So one, it generates an X. Uh, the X is going to be just some, I believe these are normally distributed. Um, it doesn't really matter. They, they are linearly related in some way. So it's a set of factors. Uh, I believe I've got 20 features. A couple of these features are redundant. A couple of these features are informative. And then a couple of these features are noise. Um, so that's kind of just the, the way the make classification thing works. Uh, and then with each of these classifications, I go ahead and have a zero or a one. So it's a binary classification problem. And so if you were using a neural network, the loss function that you would use would be, so it'd be binary cross entropy. Um, so cool, we've got our data set. Now what are we gonna do with it? So each of these data points, they're sampled independently. We're making no structure on how the data is, or making no assumptions on how the individual dimensions of this data are generated. So what do we do? So we want to go ahead and throw this into our neural network. This might not be the first thing you would actually do in practice. Perhaps you would go ahead and use a random forest or gradient boosting because these things are, are generally easier to work with, especially to begin. And they can give you a little bit more in terms of feature importance. Um, but let's say we want to go ahead and put it into a neural network. What would we do? Um, the first thing that we do, and this is with any neural network task, and you'll see this um, pretty easily later on, is that we go ahead and we uh, we standardize it. So this means we'll basically go ahead and have uh, zero mean and unit variance, right? So one variance. Um, so we go ahead, we standardize it, and we do a fit transform here. Does anyone know why we standardize it? This is kind of an interesting question. Um, this actually goes all the way back to why do you standardize a um, uh, before you do linear regression? Um, especially if you're going to be doing something like uh, regularization on top of it. So the reason why you'd standardize linear regression if you're doing regularization on top of it is that if you don't, then specific, uh, specific coefficients are going to be penalized more than other coefficients. 
So for example, if you have two features that are equally important and one feature varies from you know, 10 million to you know, 10,000 and another feature varies from 0.1 to 0.7, right? The coefficient on the 0.1 to 0.7 is gonna be much bigger, naturally speaking. Uh, but the problem there is that that coefficient is going to be penalized more from the regularization. Um, so you don't want that to happen. It's kind of adding in this weird constraint. Um, neural networks, the, the reason is uh, unfortunately a little bit different, but it sort of fits into this linear model idea. Um, with neural networks, it's gradient descent. Uh, you, you need to standardize your input or else your gradients are going to be really big in specific cases. Um, having really big gradients is just never good for a neural network. Um, so that's why we standardize. Uh, a general rule of thumb would be if you've got any, any um, linear model, you want to go ahead and standardize it. Um, if you don't have a linear model, something like gradient boosting or random forests, uh, do you need to standardize it? So you don't. Uh, you definitely don't need to standardize it. In fact, standardizing it won't change the decision function at all with, with these. Um, so it's because the standardization is a monotonic function. Um, so it, if you're interested in this sort of stuff, please leave a comment below. I'd be happy to explain it to you, but I feel like I'm going on a bit of a tangent. Um, anyways, we need to standardize before we throw data into a neural network. So after we standardize our data, we can just go ahead and throw it in. So we've got our standardized X. So what neural network do we throw it into? So I'll, I'll show you it below. Um, and it's kind of simple and it's, it's kind of an intuitive pattern. So first we go ahead and import TensorFlow. I, I use TensorFlow. I know uh, some people like PyTorch a lot better. Unfortunately, I've worked at Google before and so it's just beaten into me. Uh, so this is the thing that I use. Um, I really, I, I completely understand there's trade-offs between each. The TensorFlow, the new API, TensorFlow 2 is really good. So even if you are a PyTorch junkie, you know, give it, give it a little bit of, of hope. You know, TensorFlow is definitely coming back, baby. Um, I went ahead and I set a parameter up here, which is dropout probability. So the neural network that we're going to be using is going to be a series of layers. And these layers are going to consist of three things. They're going to consist of standardizing and normalizing. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a bit. They're going to consist of regularization slash dropout. Okay, and we'll talk about that. And they're going to consist of a dense layer. So let's start with the, with the end. A neural network, um, in, in a sense, is, uh, is basically a, a linear regression, doing a, a small linear regression with an activation function at the end of it. Um, and the reason why we don't apply just consecutive linear regressions, um, I'm not sure if you guys have heard this description before, but if you go ahead and you do sort of the matrix math behind it, it, co it collapses into a single linear regression. So we need to go ahead and and apply activation functions, which are nonlinear functions in between. Um, I've actually done a really good talk on this. This is in sort of my uh, representations talk. If you want to sort of learn about what applying different layers does to neural networks, I'll link it up here. It, it's, it's pretty cool. But regardless, we want to apply multiple layers, basically multiple linear regressions. And you can think of each linear regression, the first one sort of being like, let's take the inputs and make more useful features. And then from those more useful features, let's make more useful features again and again and again until we apply the final activation function, which for us is, uh, is going to be a sigmoid activation function because we're doing something binary. And sigmoid goes ahead and puts something between 0 and 1, so binary. Uh, at which point we take the best set of those features, we combine them in some way, uh, and then we go ahead and, and output the result. So we need to apply consecutive dense layers to it. Now, because each dense layer is kind of like a little linear regression, we also need to standardize the inputs to each layer. Um, that's, I mean, that's kind of cool in a way. It, it makes sense. So each dense layer is a little linear regression. We need to go ahead and standardize the inputs to each of these layers. I'll talk about how you do that for the internal layers. So we know that for the first layer, what we do is we, we just go ahead and we standardize it. It's simple. Uh, we just apply that standard scalar to it, which is up here. So standard scalar. Um, for the intermediate layers, we're going to use something called batch normalization. Now, there's a lot of research in this area about doing different things, using group normalization and, and such. I think, generally speaking, for most problems, um, and I think most most practitioners out there will, and, and again, no shade on, on group normalization. It's actually really cool. I think that's probably going to be the new norm. But I think for most practitioners out there, I think uh, batch normalization is, is good enough. Um, basically what batch normalization does is it goes ahead and it normalizes the inputs to the next layer. So that's kind of cool. 
Uh, and then finally, we've got regularization slash dropout. Uh, I sort of put these in the same bucket. Um, there is some, in the, in the neural network world, there's so much evidence pointing in so many different directions. There's some that basically say if you add batch normalization, you don't need to add dropout. The batch normalization is basically regularization itself. That's okay. I mean, you can, you can do that. Um, I put an optional here for a reason. Um, regularization in neural networks is the same as it would be in linear regression because one way, a good way to, one good metaphor, and you should keep lots of metaphors about this in your head, is that neural networks are applying consecutive linear regressions to, to data. Um, and so a classic regularization technique you would use for linear regression is L1 and L2 uh, regularization. Um, and if you guys don't sort of know what that is, I've, again, I've got another video on regularization up here, so check it out. Um, so these things you can also apply to neural networks. I don't do it below, but if someone comments, I can go ahead and sort of post some code that shows you how to do that. It's pretty, it's pretty simple. So those are the layers that you apply. Let's look at what this looks like in TensorFlow. So I use tf.keras. I think most people are using this. You'll see even in the TensorFlow 2 API, the uh, tf.layers is basically replaced by tf.keras, which I think is great. So we go ahead, we do an input layer. We have 20 inputs. Um, we do dropout, right? So once again, we look here. So standardize, dropout, dense layer. So we already standardized, remember, we did that standard scalar before we put the inputs in. So we've already standardized like up here. Then we do dropout, then we do dense. The activation function I use is ReLU. Just use ReLU. Um, you can use different activation functions. I, I don't think that there's much need to. I think you can probably just settle on ReLU. Um, I do a dense network that goes to 100. Uh, so in this case, it takes an input of 20 and it extracts 100 different useful features. I apply normalization, dropout, another dense layer, goes to 20 features. Normalization, dropout, another dense layer, goes to 10 features, normalization, dropout, and then a final layer, which goes to the output. Um, again, because this is a binary output, um, we go ahead and use the activation of sigmoid. Um, so sigmoid right here. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, if you guys are interested in what you do for different types of outputs, I'd be happy to go ahead and add a video just on like, hey, different outputs of neural networks and, and when would you use specific activation functions, when would you use uh, multiple loss functions, so stuff like that. Okay, so that's the basic structure you use. Um, now, a couple of questions that you probably have are, uh, how many layers uh, should you use? Um, and how many neurons should you use in each layer? I did 10 and 20. Um, you know, at one point, I felt like I had a much better answer to this. Um, and this is because I, I had sort of read fewer papers. But as more papers come out, you know, you know you've got like ResNet papers that, that go ahead and suggest like, oh, let's, let's go ahead and add just a bajillion layers. The more layers, the better. And you've got wide ResNets that go ahead and say like, oh, maybe not. Maybe actually making wider layers, okay, sort of increasing the size of, of the denses here um, and having fewer layers works out. There's been lots of Lots of results that point in lots of different directions. Um, so I'll give you a couple of rules of thumb and comment below if, you, if you've got a paper that you like that goes ahead and gives you a, a, a better rule of thumb. Um, I'm happy to listen. So one rule of thumb, uh, your neural network can have as many parameters as the number of data points that you have. Um, maybe within an order of magnitude of like two, I, I wouldn't do a neural network that has 10x the number of data points that uh, that you have, but maybe within like five is totally fine. It's a good rule of thumb. Um, normally I would just say, just sort of reach around. So if you've got 10,000 data points, you should probably have maybe 10,000, um, uh, neurons in your neural network. Uh, as for width and depth, um, there's really a ton of results. Um, I think what most, uh, nuanced people say is that just experiment, experiment with different depth and experiment with different width. Um, I, I would, I would really suggest that, uh, I mean, you should have a couple of layers in your neural network. Layers are generally good. Um, you know, just one layer just becomes linear regression, so you definitely want more than one. Um, uh, anyways, you can again watch that representation video that I had pointed out a little bit before, um, and that will sort of show you why sort of multiple layers are good. But honestly, I'm not sure what to tell you other than experimentation. Uh, there's lots of results that sort of point in different directions. Uh, some things that I think are emerging as trends are skip connections are pretty cool. Um, if you're interested in skip connections, go ahead and comment below. I can link some papers or I can do a video on it. 
Um, and alternating small and large layers might be a pretty cool thing too. Uh, so this looks like it's something in Inception, it's something in SqueezeNet. Um, a lot of these neural networks seem to do that. And, and you notice this is something I did here as well. So I went from a smaller to a larger and then I dropped back down. So that's a pretty good rule of thumb. Um, in terms of these things, in terms of optimizer and loss, loss, it really depends on, on what type of uh, problem you're doing. If you're doing binary classification, you want to use binary cross entropy. Uh, optimizer, just experiment with. RMS prop, uh, I believe, is, is, is currently the winner in terms of you know, people writing empirical papers based on what does well. Um, I believe I got this from Leslie Smith, uh, the RMS prop information. I can link a paper below or you guys can comment and ask. Um, Anyways, it, what, I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is that a lot of this is not a massive deal um, and that unfortunately, so if, and if you're in a situation where a couple of different, a couple of accuracy points matters, you're probably going to need to go ahead and experiment over lots of neural networks to figure out what's the best one for you. So uh, the, ooh, whoopsie daisies. It would be good to run these. Uh, so, oh, oh, you guys, you have to warn me when I'm doing this. So import TensorFlow. It's often a very good thing to do. Uh, make our neural networks, uh, compile the neural network, and we can look at the summary. The most important thing about the summary, generally speaking, is the total number of params. So we've got 4,000 parameters for 10,000 data points. So generally speaking, we could probably add a couple more, but this is totally fine to sort of begin with. The next thing that I always do is I, I always like using Keras's fit generator function. Uh, the reason is because this is if, if you want to go ahead and speed this up, there's a very easy way to speed it up using the fit generator function. Um, and to me, I like generators in Python. You don't have to use this one. You can literally have just fed in the, the matrices. But this one makes more sense to me. I specify the inputs. I specify the output. Standardize X. Give the batch. So it's nice for me. Uh, I use bootstrap sampling instead of just going through the entire thing. Um, there are reasons for this. And the reasons that... Um, the, the, basic, the, the basic reason for this is, is shuffling. Otherwise, you basically need to shuffle your data each time. And I often forget to shuffle. Um, if you don't shuffle your data, you get weird things. Uh, and so, yes, again, neural networks, very complex. Uh, unfortunately, it is a little bit of a practitioner's playground. But if you're inter anyways, if you're interested in any of this, just comment below. I know that I'm giving you lots of caveats. But if I didn't give you the caveats, then, then I wouldn't be explaining the sort of full complexity of it. So I like using functions that look like this. Um, batch sizes, smaller batch sizes are, are generally better, I believe. Uh, this is sort of, I've kept on top of some of the papers, but hey, you know, new papers are released every day. So there's a Jan LeCun paper that sort of talks about this. Smaller batch sizes actually act as regularization. Um, and then finally, we fit. Oh, you guys thought this would never happen. So we go over a couple of epics and we see that we get, you know, pretty decent accuracy based on this. Um, of course, we can get much higher accuracy by sort of looking at, um, by changing some of the parameters, by doing some experimentation. Uh, I'm sure if you use gradient boosting out of the box, you'd probably get higher uh, accuracy. But hey, this was sort of our beginning of neural networks for tabular data. I hope this has been sort of a, a lot, I know it's a lot of information, but hopefully it's been elucidating in certain regards. Um, hopefully this gives you a sense of what you need to do with tabular data. It's basically that formula right up there. Um, where is it? So standardize, uh, regularize, uh, linear regression, aka dense layer, and repeat. It's, it's pretty simple when it comes to that. Now, as we can sort of make more assumptions about the data and the way, and the way it is generated, uh, we can go ahead and do lots, lots of different things, which will help our neural network out a lot. So join me next time when we get to talk about adding one new thing to the data, which is adding categories. Okay, thanks. I hope this was useful.